Well, hello friends again, I'm back. So, I'm going to be commenting on a comment that was left on one of my videos. A long, smug tirade about irreducible complexity. Um, you can't quite imagine the kinds of feelings I hear when creationists talk about IC. It's a combination of, oh, well, this isn't going to be challenging at all, and, oh, how disappointing that someone is this ignorant. Michael Behe is the guy who came up with this enchanting phrase in his 1996 book, Darwin's Black Box. Uh, and it sort of took over the creationist world by storm. And we still see it brought up over and over and over again. Uh, the point I want to make here is that no... Irreducible complexity is, is not something that daunts biologists at all. It's a dead concept that we're really not that interested in anymore. Got a little bit of a stir from us at the beginning, but then we realized, oh man, this is just nonsense, and we've moved on since. And I just hope that you would, too. Okay, so let's start with Michael Behe's own definition of irreducible complexity. So, he says what it is is a single system which is composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. First things first on this definition, it's odd. It's kind of a strange definition, because he's trying to argue that explanations for the assembly of a system can be refuted by arguments about the disassembly of the same system. On the one hand, it could be an amazing counterintuitive insight obtained by looking at a problem from a different perspective. But on the other hand, it could also be a flop of an idea that fails to recognize the asymmetry in assembly versus disassembly. Uh, the consensus now is that it's the latter. It is a facile metaphor that falls apart as soon as it's examined. For example, one of the first issues people had with the argument is that there really are asymmetries in construction deconstruction, and it clearly doesn't handle that well at all. Uh, one of the first counterexamples is this one, an arch. An arch is a self-supporting structure that falls apart if you remove even one piece. It is irreducibly complex. Yet somehow arches are assembled in a stepwise fashion all the time. People build arches. We can even find lots of examples of completely natural arches. How is that possible? Those natural arches give us the answer. Uh, they were finalized by removal of something, of some kind of scaffolding. Scaffolding is the magic word here. The self-supportingness or irreducibility of the arch only arises after the whole structure is in place and then enables the removal of the scaffold. Behe's definition does not take this mechanism into account. It's a glaring omission. Another thing that Behe fails to mention is that complex systems are multifunctional. You can't simply argue for the function. There are multiple functions present in every complex system. So we have to ask, which function? Which function do you lose if you take away a piece? Uh, do you get gain of function if you remove a piece? It's a much messier situation than Behe would like you to think. One example popularized by John McDonald at the University of Delaware is the mousetrap. It's got multiple parts, it has the function of killing mice, but there are pieces that can be removed without rendering it useless. For example, remove the wooden base, and it can still work by just attaching the spring and the clip and so forth directly to the floor. You've lost one function, portability, but it's still fully capable of its primary function, killing mice. Ken Miller carries this further, and one mistake made by the creationists is the assumption that the whole thing has only one purpose, trapping mice, and that it is useless except as a whole. Well, Miller points out that the spring-loaded bit is perfectly functional, if rather ugly, as a tie clip we can find a use for every single isolated component. And this is what biology and evolution are good at. Implementing an initially crude and suboptimal answer out of parts at hand 
and then gradually refining them. This is Francois Jacob's idea of bricolage, that nature is not an engineer but a tinkerer, that what happens in evolution is the assembly of other parts into a functioning whole. Nature is not an engineer but a tinkerer, assembling a functional unit out of a collage of different parts assembled into a final unit. So, for example, in developmental biology, we're not surprised at all to see that there are genes like, for instance, to name just one of thousands of examples, toll. Uh, toll is a receptor protein that was first identified as playing a role in specifying the dorsal ventral axis of Drosophila embryos. But it was then found to be reused as part of the fly's immune system and was then subsequently found that a comparable protein was functioning as part of the immune response in vertebrates. So it's, it's a protein that gets used over and over again in multiple ways. Uh, that's an expected result from biology and evolution. You know, it's a really sad state of affairs when a useful and powerful concept like Jacob's bricolage is not as well known as Michael Behe's bogus idea of irreducible complexity. So here's another way of phrasing IC. If you can find a system with n multiple parts, where removing any one piece breaks the whole system, then we can infer that a functioning system with n minus 1 parts cannot have existed, and therefore it could not have evolved from a simpler predecessor. Checkmate evolutionists! But think it through. Basically, that implies that every system made of multiple parts is irreducibly complex. Because if something still works when you remove one piece, you can just keep going and ask to remove one more piece, then one more, then another, until it finally stops working. This, I think, is part of the sneaky appeal of the concept to creationists. It is not an honest evaluation of the validity of evolution, but a tactic for crudely dismantling biology until something breaks and then declaring that that breakage is proof that evolution fails. The logic doesn't work. Another way to think about it is to invert the logic and ask what kinds of systems are not irreducibly complex or at least are functional until you n-1 them to death. Under what conditions does the system continue to work when you take away a piece? One obvious answer is if you've got redundancy in the system. So if you break into my car and steal the spare tire, for instance, you won't actually damage the functionality of the car, at least not until I get a flat. This is a common occurrence in biology. We observe gene duplications all the time. They're a routine result of unequal crossing over and meiosis, and that's precisely how families of genes with a multiplicity of functions arise. A duplicated gene in a complex pathway, then, is one way you can get a non-IC system. As has been pointed out multiple times to creationists, this is a common process that completely gets around the problem of irreducible complexity. Duplicated genes can acquire new functions by mutations without disrupting the existing function and assemble into a new irreducibly complex system. As this diagram shows, the most common result is loss of function. A mutation kills the new gene. This happens often, and our genes are littered with pseudogenes, broken relics of old duplications. But what can also happen is that the copy is preserved because it increases gene dosage in a useful way. Some enzymes have multiple duplicates simply because it was advantageous to have more copies of the gene product available. In other cases, small mutations add or change function than the copy. You can get new abilities which may eventually become indispensable. That is, the redundancy gets functionally incorporated into an evolutionary novelty, and then it becomes irreducibly complex. That kills the whole concept of irreducible complexity, don't you think? When evolutionary processes can generate irreducibly complex systems. I see is an outcome of evolutionary processes, not a barrier. But let's talk about a specific example, though. This is Joe Thornton's work on the evolution of 
a class of steroid receptors. This is beautiful work, and it gave Behe connections. First, he dismissed it as piddling, and then he changed his mind and decided the work was great because he misinterpreted it to be in support of IC. It isn't. It's a detailed step-by-step -step description of the evolution of an irreducibly complex system, a family of steroid receptors that arose by gene duplication, in which each member became increasingly specialized to respond to different signals. And as it became responsive to different signals, these molecules became indispensable. They became irreducibly complex. Thornton's lab did this work by reconstructing the molecular intermediates and in the evolution of the pathway and identifying how they responded to hormones. The end result, to focus on one part of this diagram, is that we mammals have a glucocorticoid receptor that responds to cortisol, a hormone that suppresses the immune system and boosts metabolism. And we also have a mineral corticoid receptor that responds to aldosterone and increases the retention of sodium and excretion of potassium. One is a maintenance and repair signal. The other acts to maintain salt balance. Two rather different functions. But both evolved from an ancestral generic receptor that combined the two functions. Thornton and his lab mapped out every step in this process, amino acid by amino acid. Behe's response was to claim that each of the, out of the mutations that occurred were improbable, which is irrelevant. Millions of fish acquiring millions of mutations over millions of generations will eventually hit the combination in a reasonable amount of time. But also, Behe presented IC as a slam dunk, an absolute barrier to evolution. It's enough to show that it is conceptually circumventable. Behe also pointed out that several of the steps require two mutations and that the change can't be accomplished in a single step. Again, this is not a problem. Has he never heard of genetic drift? Mutations that don't generate functional additions can persist in a population for a good long time until an opportunity arises to combine them with another mutation. So please, creationists, do continue to bring up irreducible complexity. No biologist is going to be dismayed at all by your objection. Well, we're not going to be dismayed at all except by possibly the fact that we've got another boring discussion to hold, and we've met yet another ignorant person who doesn't understand biology. I see isn't a problem for evolution at all, and when you bring it up, all you're doing is demolishing your own credibility. Try to bring it up in an argument with me. You'll see how I respond. I might relax a little bit, take a deep breath, smile a little, and then fire off a couple of broadsides right in your face that completely demolish everything you're saying. From my perspective, it will be a pleasant and not at all challenging encounter. From your perspective, I kind of expect you'll just shut down your mind and not think any further, but then you're perfectly comfortable that you've been doing it for years, and we can all move on and ignore you. Okay, thank you, friends. We'll talk to you some other time.